Good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom alaikum. Peace be upon you. Uh, it's, so, uh, it's so great to be here and it's such an honor uh, to be in your presence. Um, I apologize for the late start. It's all my fault. Uh, I was suffering from uh, sleep deprivation. And, um, but it's, it's such an honor to be here with all of you. And uh, I'm, I'm very honored uh, you know, for, with your gracious introduction and with Reverend Joel and, uh, and with you know, uh, Dr. Reverend Jan Fuller and Shane Atkinson and your team and your staff for putting this together. Um, before I begin, uh, I'm going to begin with, um, hold on, here we go. If I have, I'm a little technically challenged. Okay, you might have to help me out here. Uh, I'm going to begin, uh, as you heard from the introduction, I have the, uh, the honor and the blessing to uh, study in different parts of the world, as well as in the United States. And I was taught by my teachers to always begin with an offering. So, and, and this offering is it's not um, a material offering, it's a spiritual gift uh, that we offer um, to acknowledge the to acknowledge the creator, uh, to acknowledge those that have come before us, the best of the generations before us, and the best that's inside of us. So I will be reciting the opening uh, chapter of the Quran, which is known as the chapter of the opening, Surah Al-Fatiha. I'll recite that and then translate that into English. And uh, I pray that it is uh, as edifying for you as it has been for me over the past uh, 24 years. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Ar-Rahmanir rahim Malik yawm al-deen Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een Ihdina al-sirat al-mustaqeem Sirat al-lazina an'amta alayhim Ghayri al-maghdubi alayhim walad the meaning of the words I recited are, I exist and seek help and blessing through the all-encompassing name of God, the unconditionally gracious, loving Redeemer. All praise and thanks belong to God, nurturer of the worlds of higher consciousness, the unconditionally gracious, loving redeemer, sovereign ruler of the day of reward. You alone do we serve. You alone do we ask for help. Guide us along the straight road, the road of those whom you have blessed, those upon whom is no wrath, those who have not gone astray. Amen. Today, we're going to be talking about mindfulness, about spirit, mindful spirituality in Islam. And so I'm asking you all to have what uh, we call in the Muslim tradition, uh, hudur, which is, I guess, how you would translate mindfulness. Hudur literally means presence. It's, it's, I guess, our word for Zen, you know, being in the moment. And so being in the moment requires that you free yourself from fear or anxiety about the future and your, your grief about loss in the past and your cell phone and other devices. 
So I ask that you be present uh, with me as we go on this journey. Uh, this is one of my favorite cities in the world. It is a mosque. It's the gate to a mosque in the uh, Sufi city of Tuba, Senegal. I was just in Tuba maybe five, six weeks ago. And uh, this city is a place that millions of people around the world make pilgrimage to every year. Uh, people from Africa, people from Europe, people from Asia, people from the United States, from South America, go to this city uh, to rejuvenate themselves spiritually, to honor the legacy of, of one of the great spiritual masters that we'll be discussing, that I'll be sharing information with about. Uh, but Tuba is a city of mindfulness. And anyone who's had the blessing to visit Tuba or any city like it, and there are a number of them around the world, it's a city that, for me, really embodies uh, a community, not just a person, not just an individual, but a whole city. Tuba is the second largest city in the country of Senegal. It has over a million residents. But how did it start? It started with a man. His name was Ahmadou Bamba, uh, a great, he was, I guess you could call him the Rumi of West Africa, prolific poet. He was also, he also led a successful nonviolent resistance movement against the French. You know, before Mahatma Gandhi, before Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and others of, of their ilk. Uh, and uh, he was in a vision. He saw that there was this city that he was destined to establish. And so he went to this spot based on a mystical vision that he said God guided him to. Uh, and he you know, set up a little, a little hut, you know, made up, up adobe, and brought some students who were scholars and, and uh, established this settlement in the middle of nowhere. It was nowhere in the middle of nowhere. Nothing was there. It was a wilderness about uh, over 100 years ago. He established Tuba in the late 1800s. And, uh, Today, it's a bustling city, right? There are mosques, there are you know, buildings, you know, uh, banks, restaurants, donkeys. They still ride donkeys there. Um, mindfulness in the Islamic Sufi tradition begins with the Quran. And the word, I wanted to define a few terms before we, we get into our topic, uh, the meat of our topic. The, the word Qur'an actually means, it, comes, it has two meanings according to Muslim scholars. The first is that which is recited. Just putting my timer on so I don't go over. And the second is that which gathers signs of God and sections that are recited. So it has these two meanings of that which is recited and that, that which unifies. The Quran literally means a unifying recitation. And one of the questions that is asked by God, Muslims believe, in the Quran is, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. Will they not contemplate upon the unifying recitation? Will they not meditate upon the Quran? And for many Muslims around the world, men, women, and children, the beginning of their practice of mindfulness starts with this book. It starts with this book, and those beads that you see on top of the book uh, for Muslims around the world are the technology that they've used for hundreds and hundreds of years uh, to, um, to repeat and to chant the names of God that they find in the Quran, the verses of the Quran, and other formulae of glorification and transcendence, seeking through that, those mantram, the transcendence of their own selves, the transcendence ultimately of time and space. 
what is Islam, who is Allah, and what is a Sufi? Islam literally means, it's a, it's a verbal noun. So if you remember back in high school, right, we learned about gerunds, I-N-G words, right? Islam is a gerund. It literally means surrendering or submitting. And oftentimes, I prefer not to use the Arabic word Islam because it stands in the way. I have to deal with, you know, in 1979, I have to deal with about 30 or 40 years of geopolitical historical baggage when I speak to American audiences, when I say the word Islam. Pictures of Ayatollah Khomeini or Genie from I Dream of Genie, uh, Salman Rushdie and you know, Osama bin Laden come into people's minds. But I really want American audiences to understand the essence of, of, this, of, of not only the term, but of the reality that the term indicates. And it is the human souls surrendering and submitting to the absolute. Whatever you know through the light of the intellect, whatever you know through your own spiritual journey to be that which is unchanging and absolute, that is what a Muslim or someone who's surrendering seeks to surrender to. In the Quran, and in the Arabic language, whether you're a, a Jew, a Christian, or a Muslim, uh, that divine reality is called Allah. Arab Christians use the word Allah in their services, in their sermons, all over the world in Arab churches. Arabized Jews use the word Allah when referring to God. Allah is not the Muslim God. I want to be clear on that. Allah is a name that indicates the, that divine reality that gathers all of the attributes that humans associate with the creator of the universe. And there are many names by which Muslims approach Allah. And in every culture, even among secular humanists and atheists, there are names that are in the Quran that resonate with people who might not have, may have a non-theistic conception of the creator. So Islam is this approach of that which is beyond time and space, okay? And this approach is accomplished through engaging the body, engaging the mind, engaging the soul in practices that peel away the layers of the self, of the ego, uh, the layers of culture, the layers of gender bias, the layers of our social political coloring in order to arrive at that which is most true in each of us. And on, 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 on Saturday, when we have our breakout sessions and our practicum, I guess, um, I'll be sharing some of those practices. So Islam is a path of surrender. Allah is the name of the divine being, the creator. And a Sufi is a person who has reached the highest levels of surrender. It's not a term that's used in the Quran. It's not a term that was actually uttered, that we know to have been uttered by Prophet Muhammad, uh, God bless his soul. But it became... Uh, conventional to refer to those Muslims who had realized, the, had embodied the message of the Quran, the wisdom, the transcendence, the healing in their own lives. Now, there is a debate as to whether, you know, the word Sufism predates Islam, right? you'll find Sufis who call themselves Sufis but don't necessarily practice Islam, right? And I think that you know, part of the, the challenge is how we understand the word Islam. When you read the Quran, Islam is not seen as a religion that began with Muhammad. God bless him and grant him peace. Islam, again, this surrendering to the creator, is something that's primordial. It's something that's ancient. And as long as human beings have sought to surrender to God, 
the message of the Quran is that is a manifestation of Islam. So Muslims see Adam and Noah and Abraham and Jesus Christ and John, the son of Zechariah and the Blessed Virgin Mary and so many others that we are familiar with in the Judeo-Christian legacy as Muslims because they were striving to surrender to God. And there are even Muslim scholars who put Buddha, the Buddha, and Confucius and others that we wouldn't necessarily associate with the, you know, the pantheon of Hebrew uh, patriarchs within the uh, community of those who possibly were, were Muslim prophets and sages. So the Sufi is the person who's reached the end. And, and one of the common proverbs that Sufis use to describe who a Sufi is that's related to our theme over the next few days is this. They say, a Sufi ibn waqtihi. The Sufi is the son or the daughter of his moment. Now what does that mean? It means that they are a human being who is constantly in a state of mindfulness that mindfulness of the instant that they're in so that whatever their response is to their fellow creatures be they mineral plant animal or human or to spirits or to the creator they always respond appropriately because their response is not again coming from the layers it's coming from the deepest the deepest place within them, the place where they are most real. And the Sufi is the son of, or daughter of his or her moment also means that the Sufi uniquely is a human being who understands the age, the era, the cycle in which they live, in which the creator has placed them. And how to respond to the challenges that that age and that era presents. So the Sufi is someone who is both transcendent, but at the same time firmly grounded in their particular, in their particular context. The picture you see here is a photo of the mosque of the Prophet Muhammad. God bless him and grant him peace. And these are, this is a person using the, the beads that, I was, that you saw on top of the Quran, they're called dhikr beads, not worry beads, right? You see that in a lot of travel guides to Muslim countries. They're called subha. A dhikr is a practice of remembering God, of recollecting your highest self. And tasbih is literally the act of declaring God's transcendence. And this mosque is here as our first photo um, in this journey of understanding the, the, the mindful spirituality in Islam because for Muslims all around the world, you know, this mosque symbolizes the beginning of the journey of mindful spirituality. Islam is really composed of three elements. The three words that you see on the side, Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. Islam, specifically speaking, relates to the surrendering of the human body to divine oneness. Iman represents the surrendering of the human intellect, the mind, to divine oneness. And Ihsan represents the surrendering of the human soul to the divine reality, to that which is unchanging. Islam relates to law and ethics. Iman relates to theology and belief. And Ihsan relates to spirituality. Ihsan relates to wayfaring, the wayfaring of the soul. 
and the beautification, or first, the, the, the purification of the soul. So the idea is that the human heart, Rumi talks about this quite a bit, that the human heart is this garden. And before you can see flowers blossoming in the garden, you have to you know, pull out all the weeds. So spirituality begins with de-weeding, gently though, right? And then after purification, you begin the process of beautification, planting seeds, cultivating that which is there, and then ultimately, ihsan, this last element. I won't call them levels because they're all supposed to be operating at the same time. You're a body, you're a mind, and you're a soul. This last element of ihsan that follows beautification relates to the illumination that a human being receives when they finally uh, perceive the divine, the divine presence. Anyone recognize this mountain? Anybody? Yes? Any? Right, so have you been there? Have you been there? Anyone been there? Anyone been there? So this is in Mecca, right? The last slide was Medina, which is about a four or five hour drive from Mecca in Saudi Arabia. And this mountain is the mountain that uh, Muhammad the prophet, God bless his soul, used to climb and meditate in. He began his mindful practice. He would, he would, he would practice mindfulness on this mountain and in this very cave. And for the Muslim, spirituality begins with entering the cave. Finding your cave first and then entering the cave. The cave is a metaphor. The cave is a metaphor for that place where you can be alone, where you can find solitude, where you can find stillness with nature and with God. That mountain is called the mountain of light. Jabal an nur the mountain of that. That's what the mountain was known as before Prophet Muhammad received the Quran. It was always known as that in the Arabia, by the Arabians. And this cave is called the cave of bewilderment. The cave of aspiration. Hira has these double dual meanings. High aspiration and bewilderment. And so Muhammad, and these names are amazing. Like if you, I mean, if you just kind of tried to work all this out on your own, you couldn't have done it any better. So Muhammad, whose name actually means the one who is oft praised, would go, would climb up this mountain, the mountain of light, and would spend months, sometimes a month at a time, in this cave, meditating, contemplating. He could see the entire valley of Mecca from this mountain. He could see the, the holy shrine, the ancient shrine, the Kaaba, from this mountain. He could see the people circumambulating, walking around the Kaaba, uh, some fully clothed, some completely naked. He could see the money changers, just like Jesus Christ, God bless his soul, saw the money changers in the temple and he overturned the tables, as the Gospels inform us. He could see the money changers. He could see the, the, the uh, market. He could see people bearing their daughters alive in Mecca. He could see robbers and bandits. He could see people worshiping idols at the cube, at the Kaaba, that their great-great-great-grandfather, Abraham, God bless his soul, established so that they would be people who were free of worshiping matter. He could see all of that from this mountain. And this mountain, that cave was his oasis. That was his retreat away from this scene, this theater. His wife, his blessed wife, Khadija the Great, used to climb that mountain. And anyone who's climbed the mountain knows that it's something else. It's, it's not easy. She would climb the mountain sometimes with children. And 
with food, she'd go up about halfway, and then he would come down halfway, and she would give him more provision so he could stay longer in his mindful practice. Khadija was a businesswoman. Some scholars estimate, some historians estimate that in our time, she would be a billionaire. She was very wealthy. But her wealth did not distract her from her relationship with God. She understood the importance of having mindful practice. The cave is the beginning of the spiritual journey for Muslims. And it is then followed by what we call the city. And the city is followed by the world. You go from the cave, from being, you know, separating yourself from society as the prophet did, to after you attain enlightenment, going back into the city, going back into the society, freeing the slaves, feeding the poor, serving, and then ultimately, once you've uh, been successful within your own context going out into the rest of the world. This is a, an artist's uh, rendition of Imam al-Ghazali, right? The great theologian, the great philosopher. Uh, he was a great spiritual master, wrote hundreds of books. Uh, he has an incredible autobiography called Deliverance from Error, where he talks about his spiritual crisis. You know, at, at, at the age of 30-something, he was one of the most renowned, intelligent people in the world. He lived around the 11th, 12th century. And like many of us today, he was afflicted with doubt and skepticism, not just about religion, but about God. And he went on, he, he gave his wife and his children and his family all the provision that he felt they would need. And he went on a journey that took him 10 years. He left his position, right? Imagine someone with tenure at a university saying, listen, I'm teaching this stuff, but I don't know if I believe it. He left his job, he left his family, to go on this quest. And he came back 10 years later, finding the truth, not through the rational faculty, which he was a, he was a master of, not through, the sense, not through sensory perception, right, which is, which is the way of knowing what's true in our time, right? empiricism, but through the illumination of his heart. And he said about mindfulness, the word, there, there are basically two words used for mindfulness in the Islamic tradition. One is fikr, which means to reflect on something. Fikr kind of rhymes with the other word we heard before, dhikr. And the other is muraqaba. Muraqaba literally means to be watchful, right? to watch over something. And he says in his magnum opus, Ihya al the rejuvenating of the sciences of the way, that contemplation, meditation, is superior to invoking God. It's superior to dhikr. Why? He says that dhikr leads to intimacy with God, recalling God's names, remembering God in your language, and especially with the names of God mentioned and revealed in the Quran, leads to closeness, a feeling of tangible closeness with the divine. Because the divine in Islam, in the Islamic tradition, is not depicted with pictures right, and images. Islam is very iconoclastic. But rather, God is seen in the Islamic tradition through the heart. God is heard through the heart. God is spoken to through the heart. And dhikr leads to this, this, this uns, this intimacy that is at the core of what it means to be human. We strive for intimacy. We strive for affection and connection. Whereas fikr, mindfulness, he said, leads to knowledge. It leads to ma'rifah. It leads to gnosis. And gnosis 
is an attribute, and knowledge is an attribute of God. And reflecting the attributes of God is what the human being is created for. So he wrote a lot about meditation. And then he has a book called The Alchemy of Happiness, al Kimiyati Sa'ada, that is in Persian. And he says that mindfulness, and this is important because in our society, I think we, we have a tendency to commodify spiritual practices that the ancients used uh, for tr very, very profound goals and objectives. We have a tendency to kind of dilute them and strip them of their higher uh, their, 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 their higher reason for being. So we have a lot of people today doing yoga. We have a lot of people doing cold yoga and hot yoga. Uh, we have people who are involved in mindfulness. And mindfulness is really good. Why? Because it helps us to de-stress and lower our blood pressure. And we have forest bathing in Japan, you know, where we, we walk through the, the forest and we kind of soak in the 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 ambiance of the of the of the of the wilderness why because it boosts our immune system we have all these things uh, that are called mindfulness and they are to an extent people have mindfulness sessions in their corporations corporate trainings why so they can be more productive employees but for Imam Ghazali and for many of these masters here, the purpose of mindfulness is to open a window, to open a window that lets divine light in. All the other things, lowering your blood pressure, you know, being, you know, the man, a, a gentleman called me from France, he watched the, of a meditation series that's on YouTube, and he's, he told me, you know, ever since I started doing meditation, I've, I've just been a lot better you know, with road rage, and I've been a lot better at my job, right? It's less stress. Thank you. <laughs> but he asked me, what's next? So all those things are good. But let us not forget, Imam Ghazali says, that the purpose of meditation is to open a, a door that will allow you to see the kingdom of heaven. Not just read about it in the Bible. Not just read about it in the Quran but to see the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Prophet Muhammad, God bless his soul, said, if it were not for the malevolent beings that circle around the heart of the children of Adam, they would have been able to gaze at the kingdoms of the heavens and the earth. And it is gazing at these kingdoms that God says about Abraham in the Quran, God bless his soul, that enabled him to attain spiritual certitude. Not conjecture, but certitude. God says, that it is thus that we show the kingdoms of the heaven and earth to Abraham in order that he be among those who are certain. So this mass, I'll start here on the right. This is Ahmadu Bamba, who I talked to you about at the beginning of the course, who founded the Sufi city of Tuba, which is it prides itself for two things, deep, deep spirituality and a nonviolent Islam. Deep spirituality and a nonviolent Islam. And that spirituality and that nonviolence, remember I, I shared with you that he defeated the colonial project of the French in Senegal nonviolently. That nonviolence and that deep spirituality are manifested in his teachings through service to humanity. To his left is uh, a living scholar. Ahmadu Bamba passed in 1927. To his left is a living scholar, Khwaja Shamsuddin Azimi. He lives in Karachi, Pakistan. And his particular spiritual uh, or, uh, order, brotherhood, sisterhood, 
spiritual fraternity, uh, places a lot of focus on mindfulness and meditation. In fact, they're known throughout the world for not building mosques, but for building meditation halls. And underneath Khwaja Shamsuddin Azimi, right over here, uh, is one of my meditation teachers, uh, Aisha uh, Vivian, who is a French Muslim. She's, you know, she's born and raised in France. And her teacher is Sheikh Ali Indo, who, uh, who is a Senegalese spiritual master and a mathematician living. And his teacher was Sheikh Abdullahi J, who was an architect and a politician and a Sufi master. And his teacher uh, was um, Sheikh uh, Sidi Hassan, who was a Mauritanian scholar. And his teacher was Ahmed Umamba. So there's a lineage of transmission. And one of the meditation techniques I'll be sharing with, uh, with you on, on Saturday is one that I learned from Aisha, who's in white, in the picture below. OK, that guy there, I'm, I've seen him somewhere before. Um, so this is a meditation, a mindfulness retreat that I led a few years ago. I think, were you, I think you were there. Yeah, you were there at that one in um, Maryland. And again, you see the, the subha, or the dhikr beads, not the worry beads, the remembrance beads. And under it really is, you know, these are the practices that constitute mindfulness for the Muslim. Dhikr, fikr, dua, and tilawa. Dhikr, we've talked a lot about already. It is the chanting, it is the remembrance of God's names, of the names of Prophet Muhammad, of other prophets, praying for them. It is asking God for his grace. It is declaring his transcendence, showing gratitude to God through formulas that come from the Quran. The fikr is Muslim mindfulness and meditation. And it takes a number of forms. It, uh, there's nature meditation, meditating on objects of nature. There is meditation on the names of God visualizing the names of God. There is meditation on a, per, a person's spiritual teacher, even. And there's even a meditation that one of my uh, teachers taught me, who's from Haiti, who's a, a Haitian Sufi master. I asked him once, I said, you know, how do you meditate? He said, I said, you know, what do you visualize? What do you say? You know, what's the mantra? He said, you don't say anything and you don't visualize anything, because all of that is from the mind. To meditate, he told me, is to listen to the sound of the silence within. To listen to the sound of the silence within. Dua is supplication. It's what we in the Judeo-Christian world, we call prayer, right? And Muslims are, you know, it's kind of iconic seeing Muslims bowing and, and prostrating. You know, that is the formal Muslim prayer. But there's also an informal prayer that Muslims do all the time. Right? And I've told people, you know, people ask me, you know, sometimes I travel and people ask me at, you know, interfaith dialogues or, or just, you know, on the street, you know, how, how often do Muslims pray, pray? And I say, well, we pray at least five times a day. And the response is, oh, that's all? I pray all the time. Well, well, we do as well, and that prayer is called dua, and supplication has an element of mindfulness in it, where you're not just reciting a lot of these prayers, which many of them come from the Quran. Many of them come from the sayings, the actual words of Prophet Muhammad, just like Christians recite the Lord's Prayer or they recite the Psalms. Uh, the, the goal of supplication is not just to say the words, but to become the words. Right. And lastly, we have tilawa, which refers to recitation of the Quran. It's, it's reading the Quran, not, as, um, not with the goal of studying it, not with the goal of extracting law from it, but as a devotional practice. A devotional practice that requires presence. And then lastly, uh, I wanted to share these two photos. 
these are two traditions that are very, very dear to me. Uh, on the right, of course, is the, you know, this, this is the symbol of transcendence for many of us in the West. Muslim or not, right, the whirling dervish. And this is a female whirling dervish. Uh, they s simulate the circumambulation of the pilgrim around the Kaaba, of the earth around the sun, of solar systems around the hub of the Milky Way, uh, and of the galaxies around the center of the universe. And this dance is more than just a cool tourist attraction, right? It's more than just Turkish culture, even though it's become that, right? It's become that. This dance, this sacred dance, is a means of mindfulness and transcendence for those who practice it according to its true principles. When Rumi, when Muhammad Jalaluddin Rumi uh, established the Mavlaviya spiritual path, you had a thousand and one days of training and discipline and humiliation sometimes even before you could even wear this frock and the hat. The hat they wear is a symbol of your tombstone. That you must die if you want to, you must die to your ego, you must die to yourself, your lower self, if the higher self or the spirit is to come forward, is to manifest in the world. And this is what mindfulness for the Muslim is all about. It's about getting in touch with the spirit so that they can live as a conscious spiritual being in this physical plane. And, um, okay, good, right on time. Uh, and then next is uh, one, of my, one of my teachers, uh, Imam Fode Drame, whose approach to mindful spirituality is very much centered on the use of verses from the Quran. And sometimes he has students reciting a particular verse of the Quran thousands of times in order to bring about states of transcendence, states of annihilation, uh, that the energy of those verses open up within the human being. He belongs to a tradition in, that's rooted in West Africa, the Jahanke people, that goes back over a thousand years. And the medicines, the spiritual medicines that he passes down uh, have been uh, passed down from him to his father and his uncles and spreading again, I want to emphasize this, spreading not only a tradition of uh, deep spirituality and scholarship for hundreds and hundreds of years, but a nonviolent approach to practicing Islam. And for many, many uh, hundreds of years, they have been known to resist and reject any military, uh, any kind of violent uh, iteration of the Muslim wisdom tradition. So I thank you so much uh, for your time and your attention. I'm looking forward to questions, comments, in a discussion uh, after we break. Uh, thank you again. May God bless you.